Williams story. <laughs> it's stark. It's savage. It's sordid. It's soul-searing. It's a lie. <laughs> Hello, me dearie <laughs> Well, tonight I shall have great pleasure, but first of all... <laughs> I'd like to sing you a few songs. So anyway, this lover is under this tree, singing to his light of love. And he tells her of his desires as follows. Will you still love me, Mary O? When he I he was hell on stage with me because I was very frightened of him. I was very frightened. And Kenneth was a demon with people that were frightened of him. No, but he he was extremely well mannered. Very well mannered. He used to say, um, come in, come in, go upstairs and read the lyric poets. I'm just lancing a boil on Louis Bum. He didn't like being touched very much. He wasn't a great chap for touching. I mean, most actors kiss each other all the time, like footballers, don't we? All that filth, you see. Playing to the audience, quite simply, when I was speaking, he would suddenly put his tongue in my ear. I don't think it occurred to me for a moment that he fancied me. And I was a little bit frightened of him. I thought he was rather formidable. I think directors were probably a bit scared of him. I'd do anything the boy said. I mean, if he said, go and lay down in the middle of Piccadilly Circus for half an hour, I would. See, there's a box of kippers. My answer will still be... No. The characteristic sound of Kenneth Williams saying no. Even his friends were sometimes rejected by him, and it was perhaps the pain of the experience that made people so wary of the man. I was myself. I used to see him across a crowded room at BBC parties, but I never approached, much as I admired him. Most people did. Today, several generations of actors and friends remembered Kenneth Williams. The Dead Comics Society unveiled a plaque to the Carry On star at his former home near Regent's Park. Not a pop star drawing the crowds in Camden today. Kenneth Charles Williams, born 1926 and died 1988, without ever having been quite at home in his skin, or so it seemed to the playwright Peter Nichols. He didn't have an expressive body. He tended to move with the face first. You know, the face was what came at you, and it was the face that he acted with. And, um, you know, hold out his hand to you and incline his head to one side, and there would be this, this smiling, funny smiling face that wasn't quite a smiling face. The brain always seemed to be working in a different way from what the face was saying. He couldn't do two things at once. He couldn't answer the phone and talk to you. Something about coordination that, um... He just couldn't do. Peter Rogers, producer of the Carry On films, for whom Kenneth Williams' best work was always verbal, never physical. When he's a, a doctor going round the ward, he does a wonderful throwaway on one occasion, passing the bed, saying, I think he says something like, and syringe his ears out while you're at it. He just, just throws it away. I don't think anybody really gets it, but, I mean, it's there. He used to do wonderful Harley Street doctors used to do coward beautifully. Never heard him do Olivier, but he, yes, he, he could do almost anybody. He used to imitate me. Not that I think there's much to imitate, but he, he'd do it. The actor Richard Pearson. Everything Williams did vocally was imposing, even if it sometimes seemed much too big for his tiny frame. Ah! And Ken would do that great... Ah! <laughs> Terrific laugh. <laughs> like a horse, I used to say. You know, you'd, you'd hear him sometimes. You'd be in the theatre, you wouldn't know he was there. And suddenly you'd hear this... <laughs> you know, that terrific noise he could make. And you, you wonder, but is it put on? You know, it probably was put on. In fact, so many things about him, so many of his responses seemed just a show, really, an exhibition. <laughs> We went to see Hugh Paddock, who was uh, on stage in a review. 
and throughout the whole of the first half, Williams was laughing that, that laugh of his, that rasping machine, <laughs> which, to all intents and purposes, seemed forced, but it wasn't, you know, I don't know what it was. Anyway, it unnerved the people on the stage completely. And in the interval, the management actually asked Mr. Williams either to restrain himself or leave the theatre. Beyond our Ken scriptwriter, Eric Merriman, Williams' laugh may have been out of place in the stalls, but it was authentic enough as a clue to his upbringing in the St Pancras district of London, which he never really left. Charlie Williams, his dad, kept a barber shop in Marchmont Street. It's still a hairdresser's today. Nobody got on with Charlie Williams. He was a real old-fashioned Victorian bully. Kenneth's older sister, Pat, a witness to Kenneth's very early sense of what was appropriate for him. Dad would come home with his present, you see. Uh, present for his son. Yeah, mate. And Ken would open his parcel, you see. A pair of boxing gloves. And he'd hold them out and he'd hand them. What am I supposed to do with these? Put them on your bleeding fist and have a fight. Get in and fight your own battles. Don't rely on your sister. No, thank you. And he just dropped them in my father's lap and walk out the room. And the old man would go mad. Oh, he'd go mad. And Ken used to just look at him with utter contempt. <laughs> I knew he was going to be an actor. The young Kenneth's childhood refuge from the raucousness of Marchmont Street life was a realm of private fantasies he called Our Game, or O.G., and Ken was every other voice. I was only ever me. And these stories he'd cook up. And they could be anything. We Today we're going for a picnic. How are we? You can use a red MG today. Uh, and, and he would describe exactly where we were going. What we were going to have to eat. How long it was going to take to get there. Who the other people in the, at the picnic were. And home again. And you say, that was good, wasn't it? Yeah, I enjoyed that day out in the country. And I really felt as if I'd been in the country. Ridiculous. The years rolled by and the plain awkward boy grew up into a plain awkward man. <laughs> and a trainee in lithographic draftsmanship. A trade which he carried over into the Royal Engineers in 1944. But within a year or two, he'd wangled his way into combined services entertainments, whose members were young servicemen putting on shows for their fellow troops. Our game, by now, had evolved into a curious set of impersonations, which were the stock in trade of Williams K.C., acting sergeant, unpaid. Peter Nichols was in the same cast, on the Far Eastern circuit. Ken always opened the show, and he used to do things like, um, Betty Davis, and then he'd do... <laughs> an imitation of Betty Davis with all the hands going and the cigarettes and things. And then straight after that, without any pause at all for the, for the, for the audience to do anything, boo, cheer, whatever they were going to do, he would go into Nellie Wallace. I was walking late at night. <laughs> go into Nellie Wallace. Then he'd say, Felix Elmer. Felix Elmer. You can imagine all the troops. Feel who? They didn't know who Felix Elmer was from Adam. And they do this above all, and to thine own self be true, and it must follow as the night, the day, thou canst not then be false to any man. Here, I do the funny voice. <laughs> and he was completely formed. I mean, I imagine he must have come out of the womb doing those voices. He just seemed so complete, you know. And I don't think he developed or changed that much. In fact, in a sense, that's one of the things I found a little bit depressing about him. I didn't feel that he moved or expanded or changed. He just mined deeper and deeper that one thing he could do so well, and that marvellous fluency and that terrific voice. Yes, I use a sort of reverend kind of voice occasionally, and in rehearsals people say, you actually, when, when you begin to talk in this very serious fashion, weighing the words very carefully, indeed the whole visage alters with the reproduction of the vocal effect. People thought of him as all these many different voices, many different characters. There was no one person that... I mean, Kenneth Williams, just as a person, without all the voices, was could be quite gloomy. 
Like Derek Nimmo, Kenneth could deploy a smoothed-out version of his voice, which he used, for example, to read his autobiography for issue on cassette. The most memorable aspect of the Guildford season was that Peter Ede, a new young London agent, came to watch my work. Your consonants are overdone, and your vowels are too clipped, he told me. There's a great danger in such mannered speech. The audience stops listening to what's being said and starts thinking about how it's being said. You'll have to watch it. I mean, it's like, would the real Kenneth Williams stand up? You know, I mean, he didn't know. He didn't know. But did he have a basic voice? And if so, what did it sound well, like? I suppose it could be nails and cockney, I suppose. But no, you never got that at all. You know. He'd go into it very easily if he wanted to, you know. Someone say, hello, Kenny, all right, mate, you know, that sort of thing. Kenneth's friend and neighbour, Paul Richardson. It's interesting that in the most intimate of circumstances, he would still be using his vocal repertoire to the full. We know this from an answer phone tape preserved by Richardson from fairly late in Williams' life. Well, I used to be in the front row of the chorus, but then I got shoved up the back, as you know. And that led to this, well, I mean, I say war wound because, I mean, certainly what incurred during the hostilities or nursus abelum, as the judges, the learned, in those weeks, might say, oh, no, and I saw one, or she had a sort of blue rinse, tacha, and, and in, the, in number four court in the old bay. Oh, at last, I said to that Denning, I said, honestly, darling, I said, I said, oh, the last, I said, you know, in those courts, oh, I can't tell you. <laughs> the trouble with Kenny, if he was, he changed characters in the middle of a sentence. So he might start as one character and finish up as uh, some total anarchic figure at the end of the sentence. He, he was very strange. Yeah, I'm like a sort of mosquito, because I meander, I flit from one thing to the other, you see. It was one of the things that made him difficult to cast in the theatre. He was useful in rep. Anybody who could play that range of parts was bound to be... But what directors were not looking for was versatility within a single role, let alone the other disruptive aspects of Kenneth's approach. An actress who worked with him had this to say. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> well, I, I certainly remember Kenneth. He was in our company for some time, and I must say that working with him, I learned one very important thing. What was that? To lock my dressing room door, darling. <laughs> That wasn't far from the truth. Betty Marsden, whose line that was, spoke from personal experience. I beat him to it, though, when we were together in uh, Cinderella at the Coliseum. And uh, I was playing the godmother. He was one of the ugly sisters, and he dressed in the dressing room next to me. And every day, every day, he'd get out there and he'd say, Well, I've got it out! I've got it out! Come along and see it and grab hold of it with your hand. It's all right, it won't bite you, won't we? Went on this night after night till one day I said, All right, Kenneth, I'm coming out. And I went out and I chased him all up the corridor and grabbed him. <laughs> I literally grabbed him. He didn't do it again. <laughs> oh, no, it's not messing him out. Those voices sometimes ran away with his life. Yet it was one of his abrupt changes of voice which originally had brought Kenneth Williams into the comedy world. It all came out of his first appearance in the West End in 1954. There was a phone call from an agent called Peter Ede, who said, he's not going to mind, but you should go down to the Arts Theatre and see Shaw's St. Joan with Siobhan McKenna, and the chap playing the dove man's name is Kenneth Williams. And if he hasn't got comedy, I'll eat my hat. Dennis Mayne Wilson, one of the few BBC comedy producers to whom Kenneth Williams hadn't sent personal letters applying for work. He went to see St. Joan. In the last scene of the last act, the dopefer has to age about 25 odd years. Kenneth Williams had done it his own way. There was no pause, no break, no turning back on audience and things. He just changed gear. Va. And at age 25 years, in Stanta, beautifully done. I was very impressed, congratulated him, and explained that I was doing this new series starring Tony Hancock. Oh, yes. And uh, offered him a part. And he went into a sort of, um, not quite God for Harry, God for England, but jolly nearly. He was awfully busy, 
and uh, didn't really fancy the wireless, you know, and um, anyway, you know, comedy's not really his scene, it, it's not, uh, it's not great theatre, is it? Uh, and anyway, BBC couldn't afford me, so, uh, brr, and I suppose my face must have dropped, must have looked very woebegone and disappointed. You, what is Nicholas laughing? <laughs> you got this tremendous laugh. He'd been sending me up all the time. And thereafter, I became a sort of character man for Hancock's half hour. The radio opportunity that finally made his voices famous. Good evening. But this strange need to disconcert people could even alarm old friends like Peter Nichols, who one night left his gloves in Kenneth's flat. And I went up to room 342, whatever it was, knocked on the door. Door opened about two inches. And Ken said, yes, what do you want? I said, oh, Ken, I think I must have left my uh, gloves here last night. Uh, what are you doing coming here Saturday morning? What are you doing coming here on Saturday morning when I could have anyone here? I could be, I could be entertaining anyone here in my own room and you're coming back on a Saturday morning, coming around here uninvited to try and push your way into my flat. I don't want to push my way into your flat. Just give me my gloves and I'll go. Oh, come on in. He said, you know, I've never got anybody here. <laughs> Quite frightening, really. The frightening side of Williams somehow always had been bound up with his solitariness and the defence of his own territory. Ken would go charging up the stairs as him, get in his room and lock him. And the old man would be banging on the door and, he, and Ken would suddenly turn on Gilbert and Sullivan. And uh, the old man would be banging and he'd just make the music go louder and louder. And I used to laugh at him. God, he's got some guts, that kid. Not many of his friends were invited into his living space. Among those who did get beyond the door were Sheila Hancock and from the cast of his next radio hit, Beyond Our Ken, Bill Pertwee. We used to go around to one another's place to uh, have a get-together before we started a series. And uh, when we went up to Kenneth Williams' flat above Baker Street Station, we'd arranged to get there at 11 and uh, knocked on the door. It was about 5 to 11. And it's, <laughs> Ken Horn said, Morning, Ken. <laughs> and William said, Go away. It's only 5 to 11. You're too early. Go away. I'm listening to the radio. And wouldn't let us in till 11 o'clock. <laughs> and then he, he only had cushions on the floor, you know, things like that to sit on. And he wouldn't let anybody use his toilet, you know, any, any, any stranger or anything like that. He had to go down to the Baker Street Station use the use the gents. <laughs> yes. But I did. I was one of the few people that used his toilet. But I had to be awfully careful that it was very clean afterwards, you know. And his flat was extraordinarily spartan. I remember he used to collect crystals and he had this glass cabinet full of very austere crystals, very beautiful but very, I don't know, cold. And his musical tastes were very kind of ethereal and pure. I have to live alone, I have to retreat into another world and this is where I think one comes back to a view of art. never anything there, you know, the milk, uh, bread, and heart, he, he got a loaf of hobis in, I remember when I went with him, but then bread knife looked as if it had never been used. You know, it was stripped for action, a real bachelor flat. Many bachelors in such circumstances have sexual action in mind, but Kenneth Williams rarely did. He traded cheerfully in sexual innuendo, both professionally and in private, and was much franker than most of his friends could have wished when it came to bodily functions. But his physical relationships, beyond the occasional pick-up, were virtually non-existent. You look in that mirror in the morning and see all that beauty and you realise, oh, it can't be shared. You know what I mean? All sharing, darling, involves this terrible loss of privacy. Now, this is a terrible thing to give up. I couldn't give it up. I must shut a door. I know I'm entirely alone. I think, in a way, he would like to have been, had someone there, be married, or have a permanent boyfriend, you know, but would never really let himself go. I mean, I don't even know for certain he's homosexual. Richard Pearson was a friend whom Kenneth visited to enjoy the feeling of a happy home with children. Paradoxically, he sometimes confided more in colleagues with whom his relationship was purely professional, like Barry Took. 
He said to me on one occasion, he said, I went to the doctor, I said, I don't know what to do, I've got these health problems, he said, not. And I'm very um, upset emotionally. I know I'm unstable emotionally. He said, and the doctor said, why don't you get yourself a petty officer, a retired petty officer out of the Navy, somebody to live with you, look after you. Old chap, get my meaning? He said, oh, I couldn't do that. I couldn't. He was too fastidious. I asked him, was he a homosexual? And he said, why? Does it make any difference? So I said, no, but I just wondered. So he said, well, if because I prefer men's company to women. If that makes me a homosexual, yes, I am. If you're asking me, am I a practicing homosexual? No, I'm not. So I said, well, that's good enough for me. He didn't express enough of his sexuality. I wish to God he had, instead of feeling so ashamed and frightened about it, which I suspect he did. In fact, I know he did. I, I don't think he liked to involve himself sexually with people, but he fell in love a, a, quite a lot, both with men and women. He certainly proposed marriage to several women, though it was usually a question of sensing their solitariness and feeling that it might match his own. Just occasionally, he did show a spark of physical response. After meeting Amanda Tennyson of BBC Bristol, Kenneth wrote in his diary that she was enchanting, the kind of girl I want to touch, and exquisite. He clearly liked me very much. He used to comment a lot on what I wore and how I looked. And I know it sounds impossible with the 90s degree of sophistication to say so. I think that's one of the reasons why I never really thought he was homosexual. I just thought he was somebody who perhaps wasn't very highly sexed about anything. I don't know. How can one tell why people fancy other people? I can't imagine. Perhaps it was because... <clears throat> perhaps it was because I looked like a boy. On his London strolls, sometimes with Paul Richardson, it was certainly male muscularity he appreciated most vocally. A, a guy on a building site said, what a trick. You know, I said, for goodness sake, he said, oh, you lovely boy, you know, and then walk away. And the guy would say, hello, Ken, he said, hello, you know, he said, lovely, and we'd rush off, you know. <laughs> so all that went on, yes, yeah, yeah. Mm. And much of it sublimated into the solitary vice of the solitary man. He called it the Barclays, short for Barclays Bank. And in its way, it was our game all over again. I think the fantasies were there, obviously, you know, but, um... Hey, come on, you get... You get this is walking down the street with him, and, and he goes for, for this, this fantasy uh, storytelling about how he met this sailor, you know. I thought, oh, for God's sake, oh, so it was lovely. It was lovely, it was divine, you know. It was all nonsense, all rubbish. I said, have you finished? Not quite, he said. I need to carry a little more, you know, it's... So wasn't that good? I said, no, it was a pile of rubbish, you know. Thank you <laughs> for nothing. <laughs> he liked being alone. I think, he, I think he was probably most himself when he was on his own. You know what I mean? And uh, it's a funny thing because, I'll tell you why, I, I was very rudely, um, I mean, I don't know where I, well, I mean, I can't. Well, I mean, I, when I say I can't, I mean, I could, but... It's not that I wouldn't, it's not that I shouldn't. I mean, it's certainly not because I wouldn't. It's, well, it's simply because I'm, I'm the laziest people in town. And, um, anyway, I had this terrible, um, I was being, uh, because I'd like to say, uh, uh, lovely evening. Really oh. Anchored and pines Hi. we have, haven't we, Joe? Oh, yes. Mm. We feel there's a crying need in this country today for men like us to get out into the open. Open, open. <laughs> yeah. It was to fulfil this long-felt want that Jewel and me opened up this dude ranch, dude. two up, two down, and one out in the yard, <laughs> or, or as we call it, the great outdoors. Yes, now what's your curriculum? Mondays is cow punching, Tuesdays is bronco busting, Wednesdays, buffalo wrestling. And Thursdays? That's flower arranging. <laughs> By the time Round the Horn took over from beyond our ken in the mid-sixties, Kenneth Williams was in demand everywhere. The carry-on films were flowing, and he'd been in three hit reviews, co-starring successively with Maggie Smith, Fenella Fielding and Sheila Hancock. In spite of his known misbehaviour in the theatre, Kenneth Williams had such strong thoughts and feelings about stagecraft that his authority made itself felt even in straight plays, the Peter Schaffer double bill, The Private Ear and The Public Eye, which reunited him with Maggie Smith, also brought him a happy partnership with Richard Pearson. I learnt a lot from him. 
Kenneth knew exactly how to orchestrate the thing. You know how you can easily play to get every possible laugh out of something. Uh, he knew not to do that. And he, m he used to mark his script, and mine, because he was quite bossy, and said, we, don't, we won't let them laugh anywhere there at all until we come to that one. We'll, you'll, you'll be so quick on the cue that they won't be able to laugh. And this is exactly the quality that critics liked. They said the play really took off. Maggie Smith herself also benefited. I think she said openly that uh, she learned an awful lot from Kenneth. Your people always say, well, isn't she marvellous how she can say that? And I know one ever gets a laugh on I wish she could learn that from him. And you see, when we did that play, she, he was above her in the, in the billing. He was the draw. Kenneth had become a star. Everywhere you went, there was Williams. We used to go around the theatre at, at night just to see his name up in lights. A part of his temperament had always been prepared for this eminence. I am a hill in a very flat country. There are some fine things in life, and I happen to be one of them. And consequently, I've done rather well at it. Performance, especially if it went badly, sometimes unlocked an anger that was not just disproportionate to the situation, but could involve anyone who got in his way. Listen to one of Paul Richardson's answer phone tapes. I did that just a minute yesterday. Oh, it was awful. Some dreadful man came up onto the stage after and said, Do you fulfill the strictures of Lord Reef, who said that everything should be for the great glory of Christianity? I said, Oh, shut up. I said, People like you wear me out. And he said, Bless you, bless you, my son. God's blood. I said, Don't give me that crap. I don't want to hear it. And then he came up afterwards when love was getting loose up the stairs, because she takes her time, as you can imagine. All right, I will uh, pray for you. I said, don't bother, as your presence here today has been embarrassing. You cause nothing but vexation, like so many of your religious friends, as you result eventually in the Spanish Inquisition, the persecution of homosexuals, uh, that's disgraceful, he said. He said, in the Bible, sodomy, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. I said, you have no evidence as to what went on in Sodom or Gomorrah. I can't discuss. I said, no, of course you can't. Dark, sir. Well, I swept. I was so angry. I was really wild. He did seem to become more intolerant as he aged. And even when he was probably only protecting himself from embarrassment, his bluff Londoner persona sometimes seemed inappropriate. My mother, very sadly, it's another line on him in a way. My mother, very sadly, had to have a double amputation latterly. So she was in a wheelchair. And uh, she was very taken with Kenneth. But to see him giving his number one performance for my mother, but overdoing it, he wanted to show that he wasn't going to be over-sympathetic to her. He said, oh, you're all tarted up today, aren't you, dear? You know, that sort of thing, which you wouldn't normally say to someone you've met without any legs for the first time, would you? He was seldom happy with strangers, and one thing he never resolved was his need for both privacy and attention in public places. Fascinating. Mm, yes, I am rather, aren't I? <laughs> you know, we used to go down to the Cardoma and Piccadilly, and he used to say, coming for a poached, you know. Mince on toast is what he really liked. He had very plebeian tastes, it seemed to me, and yet he went to all the grand restaurants. But he was a funny mixture of wanting a screen round the table. And not always very nice to fans who came up to him. But other times, if they were there, he, had, he wanted the whole room to be listening, which they always did. Because he was easily the best raconteur I've ever come across. No. Yes! But even he'd come here for dinner and hold court, really... And one would have, uh, say, people like, say, Peter Rawlinson, who was Attorney General. People were fine minds, and Kenny would outmaneuver people, really, in conversation. I mean, because he always, he always had the weapon of putting in something rather shocking. There was a, a, an old marchioness sitting here one day, and um, he said, Oh, he said, uh, I'll step in on a plane. He said, I'll drop gin all on me cock. Have you had gin on your cock? No, you haven't got a cock, have you? No. And, and then he suddenly turned on to a really quite, um, uh, some grave political problem or something in the next sentence. One simply had to accept that Kenneth was going to expose his genital fixation at every opportunity. On the carry-on set at Pinewood, the fates conspired to encourage him, as Peter Rogers saw. On one, on one occasion, 
and I think it was on carry on regardless, he was, for some unknown reason, he fell down the back of the flat of the set and squeezed himself in an unmentionable part of his body. So we took him along to medical. And in medical at that time, there was a, a sister who you could have cast in a Hammer film. And uh, he was gone for so long that Jitter and I went down to his medical and thought, where the hell is he? And he was lying on this bed and she was slapping some salve on his penis and he was thoroughly enjoying himself. He could have stayed there all the afternoon. <laughs> oh, they give you everything, the massage, all over. Oh... I never found any vulgarity offensive with Ken. I mean, that was the thing, that he could do it in such a way that it never was. I mean, it was just a marvellous purging of all things that we know we all think and feel. And, and also, when he was rude about people, he could be viciously rude about somebody, and it was usually somebody that you felt exactly the same thing. But the wonderful thing about Ken is, was he said it. You know, and you thought, oh, good, that's exactly what I think. But I'm too polite and I want to be loved too much to say it, you know. I got undressed. I was getting to bed and knock, knock. I went to the door in my pyjamas. The manager stood there. I thought you'd like a glass of champagne. I thought, oh, thank you. Oh, silly sod. Because I was like, no, I tried to down the sink. There is no means to annul one gesture, one word. These are tissue of time. These are all immortal. I have heard Egypt and her Antony were their first... And he would quote poetry constantly. He had a quote for every occasion. You'd be... I mean, I used to give him a lift home on my Lambretta after the show every night in those days. Oh, God, we were so young in those days. I couldn't do it now. And he would be shouting poetry on the back of the Lambretta as we drove around Piccadilly Circus. Sheba still turns her head for the sound of great Solomon. Judith is dressing the bed for her king to die upon. Though Helen's lips are dust, the kisses of her lips still burn the towers and must still launch a thousand ships. It was a pity that the refined and artistic side of Kenneth Williams remained, for most of his audience, a private aspect of his character. Perhaps to reveal more of it would have made him feel vulnerable, as indeed he did at the poetry reading he gave for BBC Radio. I was a bit frightened of the whole thing. In fact, when I walked onto the stage, there was a sort of, ah, oh, here he is, you know, one of those sort of reactions. And uh, I said to them, yes, it's not a role you're accustomed to see me in, and I will understand perfectly if some of you look toward the ceiling and close your eyes. Because you know this feeling one has when one's uh, being read to. If someone suddenly leans across to you and says, build me your willow cabin at your gate and call upon my soul in the house. You say, yes, that's nice. Uh, and, and look away, <laughs> feeling slightly embarrassed, you know. I don't know why this happens, but it does. He was very self-critical, oddly enough, which people, you know. And I remember him saying, that he said, I'll never really be a good actor because I won't expose myself. I suppose that should be rephrased, but you know what I mean. He didn't want the audience to see Kenneth Williams. He liked to hide behind those characters. And he hid not only behind characters, but behind his knowledge, particularly of history and of poetry, but also of music and painting. The only fragmentary opportunities he got to parade this shell of expertise came in the rough and tumble of the Just a Minute programme. He said rhododendrons, and I corrected him, he said rhododendra. And he's then sucked for the whole of the programme. The hardest another word, because I'd not exposing Achilles Hegel exactly, but it was something which he felt badly about. I was very aware that he really wanted to be an intellectual, that he really, really wanted to do terribly well in these programmes, not just because he wanted to win, but because the learning that was involved in it was important to him, the breadth of culture was important to him. It really mattered to him to be able to recognise Jane Austen and San Simone and Dickens, and, and I don't think he had a lot of insight into what he was reading. He didn't come up with intellectual responses to what he'd read in a way that surprised you or took your knowledge on further like some people did. I think he didn't want to be a comic actor who'd read a lot of books. He wanted to be a serious person who'd read a great deal and thought about it and simply made his living as a comic actor. And I don't think he quite achieved that. 
I mean, he was very manic depressive, really. He was mostly manic, but sometimes depressive. He used to suddenly plunge into these gloomy fits, you know, continually uh, having a go at life. And he'd say, well, a load of crap, a load of sheesh. Never seen such a load of sheesh in my life, you know. He had enjoyed the carry-on films for the family feeling among the troupe that made them, but eventually the series came to an end. He'd lost patience with the theatre, and it, quite possibly, with him. Television cabaret had occupied him for a few years. Children's television still did. But the succession of radio series, after Kenneth Horne's death, had gradually wound down. Chat shows, voiceovers, and personality appearances began to take the place of what had once been his craft. He was keeping to a modest daily routine, living across a landing from his widowed mother, Louis. He used to have his uh, lunch in there with Louis, you know, and then he used to go back in the evening to watch the six o'clock news on television and stay with Louis for about half past nine when he'd go into his own flats, write up his diary and go to bed. And, and up very early in the morning the next day. I mean, he'd be across Great Portland Street tube stage and get a paper that sort of, sort of ridiculous sound like quarter six in the morning. And was very proud that he'd done the Telegraph crossword within, you know, 20 minutes. I was walking along in Camden Town somewhere. I was looking rather old, I think, and I looked over the other side of the road and I thought, well, there's a funny old man over there with a cap on and a Burberry Mac looking just like me. And um, as we drew near, I saw it was Ken. Sometimes, when I've been alone too long, I think I hear you say my name again, softly as snowflakes on a window pane. And hope, a lunatic that should have died, careers about my heart in song, setting a blaze of candles there to guide your way to me. I wait. Ah, surely so, your footsteps sounded on the attic stair. The very silence sings that you are there, secretly smiling that I should delay. Quickly, I turn my head in case you go. And there's the moonlight, dead as yesterday. He's kept on thinking about death. Yeah. But in the street, you know, he said, oh, I just to die, you know, and I thought, oh, come on, you know. I mean, I remember the fortnight before he died, I met him outside Broadcasting House, and he was very, very low, and um, God, I wish I'd known how low he was, actually, but you never knew with Kenneth, I mean, sometimes it could be a bit of an act, and he went off into a wild kind of diatribe about how ill he was, and how his mum was ill, and how could he cope, and he got all these responsibilities, and he was obviously feeling extraordinarily oppressed, and he was sort of unhinged in a way really I mean I remember making a mental note thinking oh I must give him a ring I must give him because I didn't and the next thing I do see is a poster saying he's dead Will you still love me Mary oh when my brassets be bended low <laughs> when my orbs grow dim one night in Tangier, returning rather drunk to the Rembrandt Hotel, Kenneth Williams had found himself shouting up at the facade, I am your actual quality. And of course, he was right. During the run of Dundercam, when it was at its height, Kenneth Horne was interviewed by the press and was asked to what did he attribute the success of the show. And he very kindly said to them, Oh, well, it's the brilliant cast, you see they could make a telephone directory sound funny. So I thought, right, and the next week, I produced telephone directories. And I said, right, there we are, there's A to K for you, F to Z, L to R. It was a bit of a stunned silence, and then Williams picked up one of the books and went, the pneumatic drill and tongue and coming, and whatever, and made it hysterically funny. I remember once, um, in the Scorial in Spain, I went to Philip of Spain's cell, just beside this great Brock altar, and Philip of Spain had a little window which he could open and see this extraordinary opulent Rococo Brock world outside the great high altar. But he lived in a kind of white Spartan room, and I think that was Kenny's way. He'd like to look out on this extraordinary world that he'd created. I think one of the biggest tragedies of Kenneth's life, that he was an original, and I think he was a genius, I really do, I, don't, I never use that word lightly, and we can't deal with it in this country. We cannot deal with the likes of Kenneth, who's an original. 
if he'd have been born in America, he'd have had m massive shows built around him. He'd have had fields, films made that would fit his specific, unique talent. But here, he had to be a character creature. He had to fall back on his old tricks. And he didn't have anybody to say, no, Kenneth, don't do that. I mean, you don't, you don't have to do that kind of vulgarity. You actually can do this other thing, which is unique and beautiful. I mean, he proved it in his early days. It was unique. It was wonderful. This little creature, this elf on the stage. We, we were so lucky to have him.